Good morning, uh, and welcome to the session of African Americans in the Midwest. We're still waiting on uh, one panelist, but he is the last uh, person on the, uh, the session, so hopefully the people show up. Um, interesting, interesting group of papers that uh, just based on the topics uh, that are going to take us from sports, from music, from anarchism, uh, to uh, kind of community studies. And so looking forward to it. Uh, let me just go ahead and introduce everyone, uh, and then uh, they'll go in the order that is presented to the program. I am Roy Finkenbein. I'm uh, a professor of history and director of the Black Abolitionist Archive at the University of Detroit Mercy. Um, uh, and I will, I will be actually presenting later this afternoon. Um, first, we have to my immediate right, Jeremy Beer. Jeremy is going to be presenting on Forgotten Son, Oscar Charleston, Midwestern Sports Legend. Uh, he has a, a really rich uh, resume. He's uh, currently co founder and principal partner of American Philanthropic LLC, which is a consulting firm that works with over 150 nonprofit foundation clients. He has a, uh, a PhD in psychology from the University of Texas at Austin. And as I understand it, your paper is part of a larger co plan study that we're working on, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, extensive track record in the publishing field and in think tanks, large number of published articles um, on political and social topics and periodicals, as well as book chapters and two books. And he is the co-editor of American Conservatism and Encyclopedia. Um, second to my right, uh, Michelle Campbell, who uh, uh, co-authored this paper with Wesley Bishop, who is not here. They are both uh, doctors at Purdue University. The paper is Black Anarchists in the Midwest. Um, uh, Michelle is a doctoral student in 19th century American literature uh, at Purdue, and she's already published three articles in a book chapter on uh, related topics, um, and so we're very much looking forward to that. Uh, next to her, Stephen, is it Kusulu? Kusulu? Okay. A name like Pink and Mine, I try to be so sensitive to such things. Uh, and this is where we get the community studies, the African American community of Sioux Falls uh, in the first three decades of the 20th century, 1927. He is uh, an independent scholar, already having done a lengthy tour of duty at the University of Minnesota. Most recently, is the former director of the Catherine Nash Gallery at the University of Minnesota. And about 10 years ago, he started pursuing his uh, first love of history, including returning to his hometown. Of Sioux Falls uh, and looking uh, first at his own ethnic roots, the Greek community, which took him into an exploration of many other ethnic groups there, including African Americans, and uh, uh, has a long track record of presenting on, on related topics at various uh, uh, Midwestern uh, local regional history conferences. Uh, and finally, uh, and we hope he arrives, I'm very interested in, in the paper, Kevin Silva. Uh, jazz in Kansas City, the integration of the African American community. He's a recent recipient of a BA in history at Elmhurst College, but as you look through his, his, his CV, he has a long, uh, kind of double interest in music and, and awards and jazz and a whole host of things, so uh, this should be a treat. Um, he has worked in uh, the archives and special collections there at Elmhurst, and I understand this is also part of a larger study in So we're going to go in the order of uh, 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 the, the uh, program, and I'm very much looking forward to this. I think we have a rich discussion now, so if you have some interesting questions and comments, you can answer Thanks, uh, thanks, Roy. It's an honor to be here. It's a lot of fun. I haven't gotten to present yet on this uh, topic with man, so it's a, it's a trial for me. Um, I'm going to introduce you to a man who, uh, among the 62nd in the Midwestern population, was once perhaps the most famous athlete in the region. Uh, a man who, among this population segment, was every bit as relatively famous in his day as someone like Jesse Owens, Jack Johnson, or Oscar Robertson as he was in his. A man who may have put together the best overall resume in baseball history. A man who played a role in integrating American sports. A man who, to millions of people, embodied the virtues of self confidence, tenacity, and hard work. The man's name is Oscar Charleston, and here he is in a human being in the 1924-1925. Oscar 
population among which he was famous in the 1920s and 1930s when he was at his athletic peak, consisted of the nation's African Americans, and especially African Americans in the Midwest, where Charles Good was born and where he first emerged into prominence. Now this may strike you as a remarkable claim because I am going to wager you have never heard of Oscar Charles. Had anybody ever heard of Oscar Charles before this day? Go ahead. That's awesome. One person. Um, I had never heard of him. <laughs> uh, um, I um, was reading uh, The Great Baseball Historian and Father of the Analytic, Bill James, who by him one day, and I saw that he ranked Charleston as the fourth greatest baseball player of all time, behind only Babe Ruth, Willie Mays, and Tony Wagner. In other words, behind people he definitely had heard of. Ahead of Ty Cobb, ahead of Satchel Page, and Andrew Mantle, whatever. I was a baseball fan. How did I not know about this guy? So I started out to remember what I could. He played primarily in the late teens to the mid-1930s, in 1976, he became the seventh Negro League player elected to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. He was from Indiana, my native state, for some of the reasons more bad than I'm not certain. He was so good on the diamond that at the time, by both the white and the black dress, he was called the black tie top and the colored Babe Ruth. He has the most impressive statistical record in black baseball history. He managed Satchel Cage. He armed formed with Jesse Owens. He battled the very tough trash to Walter Johnson and to be also. Worth getting to know, right? Yet very few people really know anything about Charleston. There is as yet no biography, and the articles and anecdotes that exist online and in the secondary literature are pretty untrustworthy. If you have any interest after this talk and learning more, go to OscarCharleston.com. I can vouch for that because that's my website. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, although I am deeply unqualified to do so, I am writing this biography myself. It will be published by the University of Nebraska Press, like we discussed in the and allow me to share a little bit about Charleston here today and explain why I think that you love Oscar was born in Indianapolis on October 14, 1896, little name of Kinley. The man who was about to be elected president in a month or so. His parents, Tom and Mary, must have been in that uh, political campaign, and they had recently emigrated to the city from Nashville. For most of Oscar's childhood, they lived in Indianapolis' largest black neighborhood, the Indiana Avenue area, which stretches to the northwest of downtown. Uh, the Charlestons and their ten children were as poor as you would expect. Tom um, worked as a laborer, as a large man supplies now. Several of his brothers, as well as his mother, uh, made a little bit of a habit of getting into trouble with the law. Uh, Oscar avoided those difficulties himself. He left school after the eighth grade, served for a while as a bat boy for Indianapolis' best black baseball team, Indianapolis ABC and then lied his way to the Army at the age of 18. Uncle Sam assigned him to the all-black 24th Infantry and sent him to the Philippines. There he made his professional baseball debut in 1914 when the 24th Field Day team in the fourth club in Manila League. The other clubs included two all-white military teams and a team consisting of native Filipinos. If the Manila League wasn't the first league to include both all-white and all-black clubs, and by the way, played in an integrated all-star team at the end of that season. His uh, wife said it was just 30, 34 years prior to the season, prior to the uh, Jackie Robinson taking the field for the Dodgers. Uh, when he got out of the Army in 1915, Oscar returned to Indianapolis. He was 5'8", thickly built, like a linebacker, but incredibly fast. He was also both very intelligent and like his brothers and mother, who once threatened a deputy on her doorstep with an axe, uh, to have on the hot day. Most of the stories we'll read today about Oscar focus on the various brawls in which he was engaged. And most of those stories are more or less true. But they paint the distorted portrait of the man. Not only was fighting in baseball and American society at large much more common and accepted in the first third of the 20th century than it is now, you get hit an umpire, you get fights on the field. There were no suspensions. There was, there was no, you know, break it up and get back to the game. Um, but he is not, uh, as he is sometimes portrayed in the secondary literature, as a borderline psychopath or a thug. He was intensely competitive, but he was also cheerful and charming and well-liked and intellectually curious. A natty dresser and fine writer, he successfully associated with those who resided in what Mark Jefferson had recently called Negroland. He educated bourgeois, talented men of the Trump black society. Here he is, the white Jane. Fortunately, he kept a, a scrapbook, a personal scrapbook, and 
Oscar returned to Indianapolis from the Philippines in 1915 and joined the ABCs. Almost the ABCs on the right in that picture is from 1917. Oscar's in there. Uh, the ABCs were owned and managed by a man named Charles Bishop or C.I. Taylor. For most of the next seven years, college educated Taylor served as Charleston's mentor. So Kevin's not here, I mean, we'll put aside. There were many, many more college educated men in the neighborhood. Many of them went to Harvard University, Atlanta, Howard University. So CI helped Charleston King with temper and inducted it into the craft and tradition of black baseball. With the ABC, the Chicago American Giants, and the St. Louis Stars, Oscar soon established himself as the best all around player in the game, then or ever. Indianapolis Freeman and Chicago Defender, two of the leading Midwestern black newspapers of the day, ran his photo frequently beside their praise of his exploits on the field. To give just one entirely representative example, in 1919, the Defender gushed that Oscar was the quote, greatest player in the world. He has no superior, even outclassing the great Cobb. Fans take the Defender joke. When you see Charleston with the American Giants, you will see the greatest player in the world, barring your life. In 1924, Oscar left the Midwest to play for and manage the Harrisburg Giants, where he added astonishing power to his game. He would stay in the East through 1929 before coming back toward the Midwest, or to the Midwest, if you were one of the souls who include Pittsburgh in the region, to join the Homestead Parade, the rising Pittsburgh based club. He would finish his playing career with another Pittsburgh club, the Crawfords, which he also managed. Those Grays and Crawfords teams included legends like Josh Gibson. Satchel Page and Poole Upsell. From 1930 to 1935, Oscar's team, and they were always referred to as Oscar's Crawfords, included some of the greatest collections of talent baseball has ever known. The Crawfords moved to Toledo and Indianapolis in the late 1930s, and with this version of the team, Oscar gained a new traveling partner named Jesse Owens. Prior to, during, or after games, Owens, the Olympic hero, would race men, horses, and automobiles. It is a measure of Oscar's fame that he, as manager and very part-time player, was billed as the main attraction in promoting these late 1930s contests every year's office in Brooklyn. Uh, Jesse Owens did not look back at the new part of his career with great fondness. Um, he was in reading his auto, um, two autobiographical books, neither of the kind of principal biography of Owens mentioned Charleston at all. Um, In 1945, uh, Brooklyn Dodgers general manager Grant Rickey, who had liked to see Charleston play on a number of occasions over the years, um, just to know, black teams were always playing white teams. Uh, after the season, during the season, uh, white major league all-stars, things that you couldn't do. Uh, at some point, Kenneth Hall and Malcolm Landis banned in fact white major league teams from playing black teams because uh, they would fairly often be American and teams that competed. That wasn't a good one. But if you put together kind of an all-star team, you could play. They would bond from together across the country and make a lot of money. The players you know, um, got to know each other actually quite well. Uh, so Ricky uh, selected Charleston to be the manager of the Portland Brown Dodgers, which Charleston managed by his contract to manage the Portland Brown Dodgers in spring 1945. So the Brown Dodgers were Ricky's co owned entry in a new black baseball league called the United States League. And historians have long debated what Ricky had in mind in helping to launch this new league at a time when calls for sports integration had reached a high level of intensity. And there was a kind of fact that a high functioning Negro national league in place, but it wasn't clear when it was uh, The consensus is that Ricky saw the integration was coming, and he wanted to make sure the Dodgers got to jump on everyone else. His idea was to use the league as a cover for his scouts to get good looks at Negro League stars, and make a little extra money by renting out Evans Field and the White Dodgers. Well, managing the Brown Dodgers, Oscar Charleston acts as one of with him on the payroll, Ricky's front office could consult with him at any time about this or that player without arousing suspicion. And Oscar would help build dossier on potential signees. Now, alas, Oscar apparently had nothing to do with the Dodgers' decision to sign Jackie Robinson, but he did encourage Ricky to sign a catcher named Floyd Campanella, and the Dodgers were going to pass on him. Campanella went on to help the Dodgers win five National League pennants, a perennial all star, and left in the Hall of Fame. Uh, no one told me on this claim yet. Charleston was the first African American man to work as a scout for a major league team. That's not, you won't find that anywhere. Nobody seems to think that or know that. But I believe it's true. Scouts have been 
Brown Dodgers and the United States, they didn't last long, less than two seasons. And soon after Jackie Robinson took the field for the Brooklyn Dodgers on April 15, 1947, the Negro League began to suffer greatly. Once they had been a symbol of racial pride, an arena in which African American athletes could display their mastery of their craft and equality with whites. After Jackie, the league came to be seen, seen as symbols of inequity and injustice. Charles didn't manage the Philadelphia Stars during these years, late 1940s and early 1950s. He did what he could to ensure that the proud black baseball tradition was known and respected by his charges, and a number of his players went on to sign by a major league club. There's a one quote from him in the contemporary newspaper. Stars folded in 1952. In Oscar's final year in the game in 1954, he managed a wandering club called the Indianapolis Clowns. The team had talent and played to win. Uh, Hank Aaron played for the Clowns briefly in 1952, but they also relied on some gimmicks and slapstick comedy routines to pull fans from the ballpark in Little Road across the Midwest with their farm floor. This is King Tut on the left. He had a uh, broad humor. He had a, a slapstick routine with Beth Bebop, who's about two feet uh, tall, eight and a half feet tall. Um, this doesn't feel gross to me because he's saying I understand that. <laughs> it doesn't look like Clowns work. And the Clowns also had two women players in 1954. Um, and that was, it was a way to get fans in the ballpark, of course. And Oscar was so uh, intensely competitive that he got them out on the field by February, mentoring them, pushing them off because you know, they were pitching, playing the second phase, whatever they were doing. Tommy Morgan on the right there was the best. One of them is still alive, by the way. So that's, uh, so after the 1954 season ended, um, Charleston returned to his Philadelphia home, uh, where weakened by multiple myeloma, he fell down the flight of stairs, and never recovered. On October 5th, 1954, he died. So that's the quick and dirty biographical summary. Uh, but along that life's journey, he told how many stories there were and are. Oscar had the unenviable task of managing his talented but infuriating Solidistic session page. He played against major leaguers like Lee Gary, Dusty Groves, Steve Dean, Walter Johnson, and Will Feller. He made spectacular catches that caused fans to rush onto the field to stuff money into his hands. There's a lot of betting going on in the stands, so if somebody made a great catch and gets it at a game, you might pay a little bit. Just a little sampling from newspaper clippings that we put together. The Black Press bond over him, publishing a worshipful personality profile from Aeon to he was absolutely the most popular player in black baseball circa 1920 to 1933, an era in which baseball was absolutely African American's most popular sport. Late in 1933, the first year of the Negro League All Star Game, Charleston received <coughs> more fan votes than any other player, that includes Patrick Page, that includes uh, Josh Gibson, even though he was then on his last leg. A few years in 1938, uh, on each last game, he played at Comiskey Park in Chicago. He was usually around 40,000 fans. Social event for the Indianapolis uh, American community as well as ball game. And he kept getting voted in as manager after he got a pretty big you know, array. Um, he didn't stay on the side for very long. Didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't like it. So, um, why is Charleston today so obscure? I'll give you a couple of reasons. First, uh, researchers and historians didn't really get around to caring about the Negro League until the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, there was an important book published in 1970 called Only the Ball Was White by Robert Peterson. Um, but it was really no momentum until uh, from the historical perspective until the 80s and 90s. And of course, by then, Oscar had dead for several decades. Um, he left neither a memoir nor his descendants, despite being married twice, both times to intelligent women, a good family. Uh, most of the players who had played with him in his prime were gone by the time the researchers really got around to interviewing people. And uh, there's no obvious person for sports writers or historians to approach with Oscar Charleston's story. A second principal reason is that Indianapolis has done basically nothing to claim Oscar Charleston. Uh, even though, along with Oscar Robinson, who grew up a generation later in the same neighborhood and who has a school named after him, the Rose Unit, uh, he is one of the two greatest athletes ever to emerge from the city. There are no statues or public monuments honoring Charleston anywhere in D.C. aside from a park named after him in Time to time, the Indianapolis Star or a local magazine will write 
Charleston was respected, but momentum was never built for a more permanent recognition of Charleston's achievements. Now, Charleston's race is clearly one of the significant factors here. Um, but another, not unrelated to race, has been the erasure of the physical fabric of Charleston's childhood. It's hard to take photos of something that isn't there. This is what's not there. <laughs> These were neighborhoods in Indianapolis. IUPUI and the interstate, basically, and urban renewal have destroyed. He was born about where that semi trailer was there on the left side. This is the left side of the trailer. This is where he was born on Yankee Street on the near east side. These are neighborhoods that used to be on the near west side that are gone now. Ten homes he lived in that I've been able to find from directories, they're all gone. Every place is gone. Also gone, all the stadiums the ABC uh, places. So um, there's basically left almost no physical reminder of his Indianapolis life. But the evidence suggests that it is unjustified. This is what was one of the greatest athletes in American history. Uh, Bill James was right. Outside of Babe Ruth, Charleston is in the conversation of the best baseball player ever. In a poll of 24 Negro League historians conducted around the turn of the millennium, Charleston received more votes for the greatest player in Negro League history than anyone. In a separate poll, he received more votes for the greatest manager in Negro League history than anyone. Throw that together with the scout More important is what uh, Charleston meant to the larger African American community. During his time, he was perhaps the most respected man in the Negro League because of his fierce commitment to his craft. He played hard, and he was, uh, shall we say, not disinclined to take part in physical complications. Uh, there were nights in jail cells, there were fights with teammates, rivals, umpires, soldiers. Here is a cartoon from Cuba. Uh, basically, you can uh, translate it uh, thusly. What happened to the sentence from 1924? He came in high, uh, hot and high in third base. Um, third base didn't like it, hit him. Uh, Charleston hit him back. Then a soldier comes out of the crowd and starts wailing on Charleston. Charleston hit the soldier back. More soldiers come out of the crowd. <laughs> and then he's being carted off to be jail and hung essentially in that street, right? Um, again, sorry, trigger more political cartoons in Cuba in 1924 were not very good. Uh, correct. Uh, although, uh, it's actually more freedom. for the black community, the toughness necessary to make it in an unjust world, and they were near him for that. Finally, Charleston filled a critical imaginative need within the black community. The temperamental, flawed, hardworking, reliable, blue collar Charleston was clearly an every man, and every man who nevertheless served as an exemplar of what excellence was like. His mastery of the quintessentially American sport revealed what was possible for the black baseball player to achieve, and by extension, what was possible for black flourishing in America. More generally. And I just like this photo. I don't know where it first appeared. Um, I think I'm going to acquire it. Uh, you can see here this is the Quartermaster Depot team in Philadelphia during World War II. And this is a great team. And it's like Charleston was the manager of the Philly leader. Um, and this graphic gets a number of photos from the city and some social events that he did with uh, his teammates from Black and White are attending. Black baseball provided a space for these positive formation, expression, and Collective identity in the face of prejudice, fear, and danger. Black baseball also provided a public arena for the display of excellence. African American men played in all black baseball leagues because they had no choice. Once given the choice, those leagues died remarkably quick deaths. But the life of Oscar Charleston helped us realize that black baseball was never less a good thing. If we wish to add depth and nuance to our understanding of Midwestern African American culture during the first half of the 20th century, we could do worse than the study and reflect on how that culture was reflected in and nurtured by the Negro League, and especially those the greatest figure, the one and only Oscar. Of, um, uh, a lot of 
activist things at Purdue for a long time. Uh, and this paper arose out of uh, my doctoral dissertation that I'm currently writing, which is on 19th century Midwestern anarchist women writers. Um, and in thinking through that project, um, you know, everybody's white, right? Uh, and so the question came, where are the black anarchists in the 19th century, particularly in the Midwest? Uh, I was talking with Wes about this because he uh, is a great person to talk to about everything. He has a lot of opinions and a lot of things to say. Um, and he gave me a bunch of information. And I said, well, you basically just co-authored that part, so why don't we co-author it together? Um, and this is part of what we hope will become a larger project. Um, and I also have to admit, uh, as, as you will see in this paper, uh, the title is a little disingenuous because part of what I'm arguing today is the national discourse that there were no black anarchists in uh, the nation or in the Midwest in particular, although uh, research and also other print culture sources uh, uh, lead us to believe the contrary. Uh, so just keep in mind this is the beginning of a larger project and also a very small part of that. Uh, so in an 1892 interview with newspapers in Chicago, Frederick Douglass told reporters, quote, other men besides anarchists can be goaded into making and throwing bombs. And if outrages on the colored race continue, the Negro will become a chemist." Unquote. The allusion to radicalized political violence is noted by the newspaper, not for its shock value, but in the calm manner in which Douglas delivered the message. Douglas's words were cool, calm, and logically derived. Quote, the words were not uttered in passion, but came with deliberation. Mr. Douglas's eyes moistened as he proceeded, end quote. Douglas continued telling the interviewer that, quote, the terrible thirst for the blood of men must cease in the South, or as sure as night follows day, there will be an insurrection. It is the worst evidence of outlawry and disregard of justice and human rights that we should hear every day that some black man has been lynched. Douglas's interview hinting at the possibility of violent insurrection against Jim Crow, discrimination and violence, is indicative of a rhetorical shift concerning black radicalism in mainstream print culture in the late 19th century. Yet, despite the shift and despite Douglas's commentary that nothing was preventing blacks in the US from taking up radical anarchism, there remained a profound disconnect between the potential to radicalize and the insistence that blacks in the US were not doing so. As Booker T. Washington insisted to the New York Tribune in a story from 1904, Quote, no Negro had ever been an anarchist or an assassin, and no colored man had ever lifted his hand against his president. Quote. Washington proceeded to use this argument that no black anarchists existed in any real numbers, and he concluded that his method of racial uplift, acceptance of the state, and continued education and cultivation of black people's minds would be the only way in which true freedom was achieved. The lack of politically radical behavior and political violence to Washington was the simple evidence he needed. Both of these statements, delivered by major figures in the history of the U.S., point to several assumptions held at the turn of the century. First, that there were few to none black anarchists, especially in the region of the Midwest. Second, the fact that there were none was the result of certain factors. For Washington, it was the reflection of character, but more importantly, what he saw as a lack of opportunity as blacks were still primarily seen as living in rural areas of the South. Third, that methods of anarchism, rather than, its or rather than its philosophical advocation of the destruction of capitalism in the state, were really the only component of possible attraction for black men and women. Moreover, such methods would not be used on the government. Rather, violent insurrection would be a reaction to the men who insisted upon terrorizing black men, women, and children against the government's edict of emancipation. Underlying these assumptions is a basic belief that the liberation of black bodies resided in a twin project of racial uplift and full inclusion and full rights in the political state of the United States. The liberation of blacks in the U.S. would therefore be achieved only when access to political and cultural hierarchies were made available. From these observations, we, Wes and I, uh, argue that a conflict of factors, including the role of the state in emancipation and protection, racial uplift rhetoric and anti-immigration anarchist sentiment prevented the rise of a visible contingent of black anarchists in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And uh, we put emphasis on the visible contingent. We know that there were some, but they are not visible. Uh, this mindset, though, began to change in the 20th century, particularly in the Midwest. 
The International Workers of the World, IWW, was founded around 1905 in the Midwest, and as more radical uh, black political actors combine their efforts to improve living conditions and political power with critiques that envision power outside of the state, an anti-statist black radicalism began to emerge. This change speaks to one of the more interesting and profound shifts in American political thought as political and social actors and some of the most oppressed groups of American history interacted with the federal state in myriad ways. In this paper, we will examine primary documents that illustrate a tension between anarchism and black Americans that forms part of the national discourse that explicitly denies the existence of black anarchists, and we'll give a few explanations of how this discourse served to deny the coexistence of black and anarchist identities. Uh, in the larger version of this project, we aim to look backward from the rise of Black Lives Matter movement in Ferguson, which is kind of where it got traction, uh, a movement we identify as anti-statist and anarchist, um, and moving from that to this national rhetoric in the print culture of the late 19th century of, and this is the headline that is in a lot of uh, the newspaper articles we found, no Negro anarchists. In this particular paper, however, we only have time to look at the beginnings of this national rhetoric and offer some suggestions as how we got from there to here. Newspapers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries contain a strong message to their readers. There are no Negro anarchists. This trope rose to the surface again and again over 30 years. In 1891, the Indianapolis News reported on a meeting in which W.J. Luce, the editor of the Apostle Guide, argued for education for people of color. He told listeners, quote, educated and Christianized, what will he be? A strength to our Christian society, a bulwark to our American institutions. The Negro is an American is an American born, and American is every drop of his blood. There is not a Negro infidel under America's sun, not a Negro anarchist, nihilist, socialist, or tramp. The only emigrant who did not come here of his own will, the Negro constitutes the only proletariat in this land that loves and honors and appreciates our American institution." Unquote. Two years later, in 1893, the Wilkes-Barre Times Leader reported on the annual meeting of the African Methodist Missionary Society in Ocean Grove, New Jersey, during which the Reverend J. H. Palmer DB said, uh, according to the paper, that, quote, the Negro was not an anarchist, but an orderly law-abiding citizen, one that the white man found good enough to associate with when the election time was on hand. In 1896, while camp campaigning for then Major William McKinley, Chauncey Depew rallied schoolboys and college men in Canton. According to the New York Times, Depew told the young men, quote, it is only one generation since he came from slavery to be a free man, but no one ever saw a Negro socialist or a Negro anarchist, unquote. In 1903, Kansas Normal student Miss Maddie Bradshaw in an essay published in the Topeka Daily Capital titled, quote, the Negro struggle for existence as seen from the viewpoint of one of the race who is a student of Kansas Normal, you know, probably shorten that title, uh, mm -hmm. explained to readers that, quote, the Negro may be proud of one thing, and that is they have never produced a Negro anarchist, communist, or nihilist, unquote. She added, quote, they are not made in 1905, in the New York Age, Johnny Milholland hedged his language, announcing, quote, there may be Negro anarchists, but I have never met one. And yet you have suffered enough to make the whole race cry out against every semblance of restraint, unquote. The Ju July 17, 1915 edition of the Houston Post republished a story from the Baltimore News in which former se Senator Josiah Bailey extemporaneously touched on the subject, quote, he had kind words to say about the Negro, insisting that he can work out his problem in the South by clear recognition of the superiority of the white race. I never saw a Negro anarchist or socialist, he declared. Negroes do not make bombs to blow up the Capitol or try to end the war in Europe by using bombs here." Unquote. And even though there had been reports by the Kansas City Sun in 1919 that IWW literature had been distributed specifically recruiting people of color in Akron, Ohio, Less than a year later, in 1920, Julius Chambers in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle still questioned, quote, has anybody heard of a Negro anarchist in the United States? Diligent inquiry on my part, apparently not very diligent, extending over weeks has not disclosed a single anarchist with a black face, unquote. The companion discourse to no Negro anarchist was that of the ideal citizen. People of color were referred to as real Americans, a convenient discourse that rhetorically enfranchised the same people who had only a few decades previously but previous been enslaved in the South and had been second class citizens in the North. This discourse served to create a hierarchy between anarchists who engaged in direct action and created an ideal black citizen. 
Unlike anarchists who believed in a foreign ideology, uh, or so it was uh, uh, referred to, black Americans were praised for enduring hardship and coming through it not as embittered and violent like anarchists, but respectable, law-abiding, and faithful citizens. Chauncey Depew told school boys and college men in 1896, quote, the colored people of the United States accept the Emancipation Proclamation of Abraham Lincoln as it was given to the world. They accept American citizenship as it came from the pen of the great liberator and greatest American citizen, that all men are created equal with one another and with inalienable rights, that no man is better than another before the law, but all are equal. The rest is American opportunity under American liberty. In 1905, uh, John Hillholland wondered at the endurance of people of color as they were time and again brutalized by the institutions in which they put their faith, all to make a point about their dedication and belief in the system. Quote, you have held fast your faith in the ultimate triumph of the strictly legal processes and a calm judicial procedure. Never was trial more severe, never has it been withstood more triumphantly. Lawlessness has not made you lawless, lynching have not these rhetorical moves, which positioned African Americans as both real Americans, as well as loyal and therefore not possibly radical or dangerous anarchists, was housed within a deeper anti-foreign attitude. The xenophobia was commonly expressed in the newspaper accounts, which, which initially in the early 19th century pitted both native people of color in the US against working class immigrants. As the New Brunswick Daily Times stated in 1892, quote, is it true that the Negroes are a threatening class? Can anyone deny that in their day of deepest degradation that they have shown loyalty? Who can mention a Negro strike, a Negro anarchist, or a radical socialist? What such a report lacks in accuracy is compensated for the heavy rhetorical work it is doing. In fact, it is precisely this rhetorical turn that makes such accounts so important to understanding how blacks in the US were positioned in relation to the state. Simultaneously derided as brutish and savage by mainstream print culture, and from this, therefore, justified as targets for white supremacist actions of extrajudicial punitive action, the same mainstream press insisted that such a captive audience had to be seen as a politically docile group, dependent on the state and loyal to the electoral democratic system they were denied. This the blacks in the United States is not only loyal, but also pitted them against their natural allies, the economically exploited recent immigrants. The Daily Times article continues, quote, foreigners came to this country ignorant in the extreme, and many of them full of sentiments of anarchy, and even, parentheses, before they have learned the names of the state, parentheses, begin to let this country know that they intended to have some, some say concerning who shall rule. This was compared to the supposedly docile and loyal native black man, woman, and child who, according to the story, understood their relation to the state and thereby cultivated their social and moral characters before embarking on politics. Quote, the intelligent, self-reliant, industrious Negro will conquer his rights, the Daily Times argued. Quote, he is becoming more provident in his habits, more moral in his conduct, more temperate in his religious zeal, and is, in short, becoming a more worthy member of society. As the discourse goes, blacks cannot be radicals because radicals are foreigners. It is not necessarily the fact that black Americans were citizens, it was that they had the possibility of becoming full citizens, or at least, as the time writer puts it, quote, a more worthy member of society. For blacks in the United States, racial uplift, which promised full or at least more inclusive citizenship, was the dominant discursive path to liberation. To eschew this discourse in favor of destruction of the state would mean immediate demonization. In this paper, Wes and I had examined the rhetorical discourse of no Negro anarchists in the print culture of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. We have also analyzed how this discourse posited black Americans as ideal citizens and against immigrant radicals. Although the dominant rhetorical narrative, both, both nationally and in Midwestern print culture, was that there were no Negro anarchists and never would be, by 1905, the IWW had done enough groundwork to form an organization that did, in fact, include black anarchists. In October 1919, the Wichita Daily Eagle reported the headline, Negroes
Girl IWW is held. The short notice hails from St. Louis and reads, quote, a federal warrant charging violation of the Espionage Act in attempting to incite resistance to the U.S. government was issued today against L4 Whiteman, a Negro, whom the police claim admits that he is an IWW organizer. Whiteman was arrested last week while addressing 11 white men who were also arrested at the time. L. Fort Whiteman was not the first, nor was he the last, black anarchist in the United States. He is just one of hundreds, if not thousands, of names we know, names that broke through the narrative of no Negro anarchists, further complicating the intersection of race and radical politics in the nation and in the Midwest. Thank you. Okay, so that's the, um, the first. Um, uh, regarding sports, uh, there was uh, an African American uh, fellow in Sioux Falls in uh, 1922. Uh, Congo Collins. Uh, there was an exhibition game where the uh, uh, where Babe Ruth played, and Congo pitched against Babe Ruth, and Congo's be distinguished for a number of reasons, maybe. Uh, Big Ruth hit a uh, Grand Slam home run off Congo. Okay. Congo uh, played for the Congo team. And the Congo team was a Congregationalist team. And that's where the name Congo came from, not from the Congo. And uh, he uh, was a student at Washington High School at the time uh, that he was uh, uh, taken to the woodshed by Big Ruth. Uh, as exhibition game sponsored by the American Legion. He was the only black player on the team. Uh, and that says a lot about South Dakota in a number of different ways. Uh, who knows the famous uh, former uh, athletic director at Tuskegee University? What's the name? What's uh, his name? Cleve Abbott? Huh? You talking about Cleve Abbott? Yes. Cleve Abbott was a student at uh, Watertown High School back in uh, 1907 or something like that. Went to the University of South Dakota, or South Dakota State University, where he um, majored in dairy, dairy farming. Uh, some good stories about him. Was, uh, uh, he um, was the, um, went into football and became the star a star player. I think he was a line a lineman, but I'm not sure. Uh, then he, um, the president uh, of this, uh, the dean of the college, went to Washington D.C. back in the old days for some meeting related to African Americans uh, improvement, 
and given that there are no African Americans in South Dakota considered in other places, it was kind of interesting. And he ran into the uh, to Booker T. Washington on the train, and they started talking. And he said, "I got this guy here." But in the conversation, he said, "I had this player here," and 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 uh, Booker T. Washington says, "Well, call me when he graduates or uh, get in touch with me." So uh, Washington had died by the time that uh, uh, the uh, fellow got a hold of the school, and that's how through the letter that uh, Booker T. Washington had supplied. He became then involved down there. So he's another example. So he was a high school student in uh, Sioux Falls, in Water Watertown, a smaller town in South Dakota, I think about 3,000, 4,000 at the time. Now, let's see here. Okay, uh, the idea today, and an anarchist, so things change. Uh, I'm going to give some background information uh, on the research project. Uh, nature and pur pur uh, Purpose and uh, Methods of Inquiry, an overview of some of the preliminary, dis preliminary discoveries related to the lesser known ethnic communities of South Dakota, and third is to provide an overview of the growth of the colored community and some of the particular challenges it faces. The larger uh, 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 research project, this is the title, and these are the people that I am looking at in South Dakota. Uh, you see, Christians and Muslims, it should not be Lebanese, it should be Syrian. I, I pulled up an old slide that this, there, there were no Lebanese in this time period because Lebanon was a country of Syria. And the term used on all the documents and every place else for those who are Muslim were Mohammedans. And in 1915, uh, there were 250 Muslims in Sioux Falls involved in various kinds of uh, business activities as well as peddlers. Um, there are four basic uh, research questions related to these uh, ethnic communities. Who are members of the, of the community? Where do they live? What do they do? In answering this, I'm trying to develop a demographic profile and biographical sketch of each person. Some are going to be full and some are going to be very uh, minimal. Uh, the second thing is, where, uh, what were the particular economic and social characteristics of each community? Each community was different, each of these different ethnic communities, uh, in different ways. The third thing is, what were the relationship of the various ethnic communities to one another? Uh, what the, and what were the similarities and differences? Uh, and then, what was the relationship of the individual communities to the larger communities in which they existed? And my uh, claim is you cannot understand anything about any of these communities without understanding the relationship to the larger community because they existed within the con a, a larger context, both economic and cultural. Uh, this is a little bit of a, gives you an idea about some of the things I've been doing, trying to find uh, more out of, about the larger context. And Sioux Falls in the 1920s was thoroughly involved in a jazz age, uh, roaring 20s in music, and in address, the the uh, they had buyers from the department stores went to to uh, New York City to get the latest and Paris fashions. Everything was. You went to the smaller towns. The bankers and the businessmen were a reflection of Sioux Falls. Sioux Falls was the cultural capital of the state and the economic capital. And uh, in terms of the uh, economy, uh, it was a multi-faceted economy. It was you had meatpacking, you had ice cream, uh, national. Ben's ice cream distributed as a butter brickle candy bar in about 50 states. Uh, cost a nickel butter brickle candy bar. I remember that ever since I was a kid. So you had all kinds of different things going on. And uh, these other presentations are brought to develop. My understanding of the context of the various communities uh, as they existed. And what is true for Sioux Falls tends to be true for the eastern South Dakota. And um, with the exception of the farm, Life. We don't know what was going on with the farmers and if they were doing the Charleston. But uh, certainly uh, uh, you had African American bands, they called the territorial bands, going up to Huron on, the fourth, on uh, New Year's Eve to perform, or down in Canton, and these were smaller towns, and so you know that there was some penetration of the jazz culture into the state. The question is, what was going on in, in say, West Virginia? or Appalachia or other uh, places, uh, 
for, into the south, uh, where was the jazz culture there? How was it? In 1927 or so, the Grand Old Opry, Opera came on the radio from Chicago, it's a Chicago program that was, I, I think it could be a case to be made with some research as anti-jazz in a way, it was going back to a different kind of, of uh, culture. Anyone know anything about her? It's an idea for research. Okay, uh, what are the themes? If we're going to understand these uh, ethnic communities and the large, in relationship to the larger culture, these are the things I'm interested in. Integration, social, economic, geographical, and interconnectedness. Geographical interconnectedness. Assimilation, uh, that's reconstruction of identity, especially for the ethnic uh, groups that came from uh, overseas. The Greeks, uh, the Russian Jews, uh, they came from cultures that were not quite uh, the same as uh, we get here. A stereotypes, prejudices, and, sti and stigmatization. Uh, Discrimination, what was the nature of the discrimination, if any? A segregation, which is imposed or self-imposed, because there, these ethnic communities, and I'll go on to this later, were extremely, uh, uh, I'll just say it, I'll, I'll come to it later, I can't, always, mind is going, my mind is going. Uh, economic and social mobility, occupational niche, niches and pathways to mobility, um, communications networks, which are essential to understand these different groups, and then social bubbles, echo chambers, and gated minds, uh, communities of the mind. Uh, uh, South Dakota's flyover land, as you probably know, and uh, for East Coast people uh, have a very uh, jaundiced understanding of the, uh, of the I'll, I'll make this case, in, in, the, in the 1915 or so, they begin to have this Americanization effort to help immigrants uh, become Americanized. The assumption is, of course, that they were uh, they had a, 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 they had a lack of Americanization. They were not fully Americanized. East Coast tended to look at that as these foreign Southern Europeans are a problem for our country, and what can be done with them? And South Dakota, which was a land of immigrants, I think half of the the population at that time was either first or second generation. The immigrants were welcomed and the Americanization program was often a celebration of diversity. Uh, so if you get into this and look at it, South Dakota had, had an open cosmopolitan mindset. Out East had a provincial and uh, closed mindset. mindset. Some of the, the newspapers and so on, you didn't find that so, uh, in South Dakota. The governor, by the way, Norbeck, was more radical than my U.S. congressman, Keith Ellison. So that's true. Okay, here's the problem of assimilation. Uh, I, I babysit the uh, Larry Kirk when he was a kid. Uh, the folks were trying to make sure that he maintained you know, state weak. You know, be a good boy, Steve. Very nice Greek girl. My son, who's now fourth, uh, you know, uh, fourth Greek. Very nice Greek girl. This is another Sioux Falls boy who went to uh, Japan, worked for Boeing. Came from the other side of the tracks, by the way, which is very important to understand the ethnic communities. He was from the, uh, the working family. Uh, married Japanese, and he's still trying to be somewhat Greek, but it's a little problem. And so the question of, uh, of assimilation, over time is an important question for today with the new immigrants and for uh, the future. How are we going to do on time? You can get that 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay, well then I'm going to go fast. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> okay, so here's the uh, uh, other thing I'm interested in in terms of uh, assimilation, Malaysia. Malaysia is a multicultural uh, country and the question is a question of identity, ethnic identity. When you have three different ethnic groups and you have uh, four different religions. I accept, said, I suggest you all take a trip via Google. Uh, I, my approach is grassroots. I use uh, primary source documents almost exclusively, city directory, Sanborn insurance maps, uh, census documents, high school yearbooks, vintage newspaper and postcards, and uh, 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 photographs and uh, newspapers. 
this is a Sanborn map uh, as a composite to show downtown Sioux Falls area. Uh, if you don't know where South Dakota is, this is South Dakota. This is Sioux Falls, okay? Five, rail, five passenger railroad stations, seven movie theaters in 1927. Uh, restaurants open all night long. It was the capital, economic capital of the state, of this part of the state. You can see, by the way, the railroads. Over here is prairie, that's all, uh, not prairie, uh, tumbleweed. That's my, my view, uh, not theirs. And here's a little bit of idea about population growth in Sioux Falls. So in 19, uh, oh, 1910, it was about 10,000, and 1930, it was 30,000. So it's continual growth, which meant for new job creation all the time. Out east, when the, the, the city had grown, it didn't have the same option, option for growth. And Sioux Falls was very rich, and relatively speaking, to a lot of the other communities. Um, it, South Dakota is very accepting of persons of different ethnic backgrounds. The state was relatively uh, integrated in terms of ethnicity and religion. Uh, not like Minneapolis, which is terrible. Uh, the clear evidence of the social pecking order based on uh, social status and significant segregation within the, the city, uh, self-segregation uh, took place. Uh, uh, the ethnic communities were small in terms of number, yet omnipresent every, everywhere downtown, and, uh, uh, dominant in their occupational niches, uh, and themselves marked by social stratification, and uh, marked by mobility from the other side of the tent track, and most successful in terms of economic and social mobility among the ethnic groups of the state. Um, even the African Americans did fairly well. These are the niches, and you can see the Syrians peddling dry good confectionaries, the Jews, junkyards, jewelry stores, secondhand stores, clothing stores, and they had the uh, largest uh, uh, business in South Dakota before the prohibition of the Sioux Falls Brewery was a major. Uh, there was a Syrian or a Muslim, I think, who was one of the brewmasters at one point. Greeks, shoe shines, so on, and African Americans, porters, janitors, barbershop beauty, and automobile garages. These are the niches. People went into the niche. Social mobility was not based upon pulling yourself up by the bootstrap. It was not. There was no Horatio elders. It was these different ethnic groups who were formed communities. There were support groups to help people along. Uh, self segregation now uh, it was all forms. Uh, I have a friend who's a, a wealthy from the country club, a kind of acquaintance. Is this, uh, he, he as a kid who said he had two friendship circles school year, everyone, uh, summer, country club. And that, uh, uh, these, uh, even in, among the Greeks, the Greeks who had restaurants associated with one another, the Greeks who worked on the railroads did not. Okay, this is the idea about the, about the diversity. Here you see the Megana uh, Cafe is uh, Greek, and then the Bechtold story was uh, some other nationality, I don't remember, uh, Belton maybe. Uh, down the street, uh, Tom Wing Lee's Chop Sweet Cafe, Wing Lee is Chinese, uh, Grill Grillis uh, Shushine, uh, Kim Wong uh, restaurant looked German, and up and down the street on both sides were were all these different ethnic groups. Uh, around the front, the uh, Sugar Bowl, the Sugar Bowl, uh, this was not a place that blue collar people went to. This was a place where dainty lunches were served. And so uh, African Americans probably wouldn't go there, and most Greeks wouldn't go there unless they had, they, they went to dainty lunch places. Uh, downtown Sioux Falls was divided, different sections, that uh, one area right here is where that uh, shop was in downtown, fashion, high fashion, blue collar, and so on. Greeks were everywhere. These are 1927, basically Greek restaurants, except for the uh, Washington Tea Brook, Washington Tea, Booker T. Washington Center was a, at that time established. And who lived where? This is the brewery I mentioned, 
up here on the hill. And here's the Booker T. Washington Center off to what, some of the railroad, but not too bad. And here is, is the that center of the town. Uh, and ethnic background on by the uh, brewery. You had Syrian, Black, and Yiddish. They're Jewish, they, their language was listed as Yiddish, they're Russian Jews up there. Uh, Syrians who were uh, supporting the war effort in World War I, well, most of these are Muslims. Okay, so I want to go right into the early time period here. This is Richard Wright. Uh, he was an African American head of, um, of he's a barber. Uh, he was important because he was a uh, representative of that community. That's where the barber shop was located with the red arrow. Uh, the blue arrow is a weak place. This is another place with looking at the barber shop when, uh, a few years later. You see he was advertising a Lutheran a normal school newspaper. Uh, his son uh, graduated from Howard University. The dentist who had gone to uh, Washington High School was one of the first graduates of Washington High School in uh, 1907. And here Wilbur Wright, you can see, is uh, on the reception committee for McKinley. Uh, he, there's this uh, uh, alternate to the uh, county convention, uh, endorsed, he gives an endorsement for the Board of uh, Education. Uh, that's his son there at a graduation from high school. There are only 60 students. He's one of 60 students. Um, and there is an, the Barber's Union. And you can see two African Americans in the Barber's Union. Uh, the uh, Barbers uh, are probably W.S. W. Butler and John Dorsey. Uh, they come up now and again. And Dorsey ran the Grumman News Service out of the bar Butler, out of the uh, barber shop of the uh, all right. Uh, by the way, here the same time period, you can see the uh, uh, people here. Here, twelve dry goods stores, six Syrian, four of which are owned by Muslims in 1903. Uh, so the stigma comes. Let's, two minutes. My stigma. This is the background. The African Americans in Sioux Falls were integrated institutionally into the city through the politics to the city, but the background, advertisements in the newspaper, gasoline alley, some other thing, and on and on through a petition of these kinds of articles. So that the Jews and others had been stigmatized in different ways, not like this, and uh, they were not, uh, in Sioux Falls particularly, none of the ethnic groups had the problems they had out in the East Coast, but the African Americans had this problem, and uh, then came birth of the nation. 1916, 1917. Terrible film, but you need to look at in detail what that uh, was about. Look on the snowy fields of cotton on a, sleep, a sleepy plantation down in Dixieland, and immediately you'll experience the drowsy hum of the bee and the ever droning song of the darkies in their native heart. I'll let you read them. Can we, everyone can read them from here. This gives you, I'm taking all the clips out of these articles in the Argus Leader, which was not a racist paper in a sense. These were probably partly written by the, uh, and it's reconstruction of history and repeating the worst types of things for a stigma. Ready? This was a woman writing about the film. All the kids and boys should see this wonderful film. This is a woman from Madison. Civil War veterans from South Dakota going to see the film in mass. Illinois Central and Dakota Central, all trains coming down. There are 250 people that got off the train uh, one day apparently just to see the film. And this was no film like this that had ever taken place in Sioux Falls or nationally. It's the first real motion picture and it's the worst thing in the world. Now, there's a fellow from South Dakota, uh, uh, what's his name? See, I can't remember names. He was the first African-American filmmaker and he... Uh, Oscar Michel. 
Huh? Michelle. Yes. He, he was a, a he grew up, he was a homesteader in South Dakota. He did a film uh, against the uh, uh, kind of report to the birth of the nation. Another South Dakota boy. Fourteen thousand dollars in two weeks receipts. And, uh, 1915. 1917, we see here the uh, Sawyer Johnsons, and I'm going to go with what happens then is that after this film, there's a movement in the, in the community to build a stronger Af African-American uh, sense of identity. You had the NAACP, you had Robert T. Washington Center, you had the, the, the Baptist Church, St. John's Baptist, and uh, the YMCA, the development of the YMCA. Um, this is the Friar Johnson's. It was built uh, just a few years after the other photo. And the woman, uh, uh, Mitchell, and her husband were involved in the beauty salon. It was a large, large salon. I don't know, um, well, maybe that was a salon. Newspaper advertisement in the, in the paper for her salon. Uh, in the basement, you had Buckster Mott, Mott, Moxley doing hair bobs for white women and men. I don't know where you'd find that in any uh, place uh, very often. Uh, and this is uh, uh, rear bow tie respectability. The, the demand was for respectability to be respected and treated with respect and dignity. They were equal in terms of integration, largely, but respect is what they wanted from, uh, given the uh, the history of the, of the background of the psychology, the poison fog, and two two things that uh, happened. The um, an Air Force base came around 1943 to Sioux Falls with all these white officers. All the white officers came. I thought, go, 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 wing it. You can't wing it. So anyway, these white officers came from the south, and they demanded segregation of the restaurants. And there was a fellow there, uh, whose son now is running for mayor of Sioux Falls, um, and uh, Kenny Anderson. And he came up to a woman who's now nine years old who told me this story. Her, a white woman whose uh, son married Kenny's sister, and said Kenny came up to her and said, I never knew. I was That was, um, that was it. Terrible. And I'm now going to be doing a program with some of the survivors, that are some of the people my age, about their experience uh, and the problems that uh, came up after the, uh, ninth, after the Air Force Base and in the future. And so there's a, this will be like an oral history. And uh, what I'm doing now, I can probably have about six hours worth of slides. And, mm -hmm. and there's a lot there. And uh, anyway, that's my story. Um, well, just to draw quickly, what I see going on here is, is uh, um, obviously in among, uh, amongst African Americans in the Midwest, there are a lot of money supported topics and themes. And these three uh, presentations have uh, explored them. Uh, you know, obviously, it's gotten help for of great importance, uh, and, and I think it reflects the broader question of, of why athletes in the West may be still undiscovered, need to be discovered. Uh, so, of course, we're going to be there. Um, you know, very black political thought and action, and the fact that there are no black anarchists yet, there are black anarchists. Um, and, and these these undiscovered uh, black communities. Uh, in an earlier time across the Midwest, outside of the major cities that we often ignore. And, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just to point out the stereotype, pardon my particular director, but, uh, I was a big fan of Johnny Carson in his day. And Johnny Carson in the 1980s, and Jesse Jackson was uh, running for president in 1988. But Carson, in his monologue, announced that uh, Jesse Jackson was out in, in uh, Iowa. Something for the black folk, and then this, you know, from uh, Grimshaw, and, and he 
yeah, so it's a, it's a guy in Davenport named Lavar. Well, what he's pointing to is a stereotype we have there to the fact that, that, that public perception is that these communities didn't really exist outside of large cities. The fact is, in, in the 19th century, which I focus on, uh, African American farm settlements and, and in smaller communities were the norm for African Americans. It wasn't the large urban centers of development in the century that was great migration. So I think there's a lot of work to do. These folks have been applauded for what they're engaged in, and I'd open it up to your questions and comments. If you have a particular person you want to direct it to, direct it to them. Okay, um, good question for your
part of you know, part of the argument you're making here is that the, this rhetoric being put out by American leaders is that we're not going to so the black people are not this. And there's an interesting, like, massive silence within that statement. And I'm not trying to figure out how much it was based on gender and how much it was based on racial identity. And that sounds his name, Lucy Parsons, right? Yeah. Um, who was, you know, yeah. long-time anarchist, um, you know, labor activist until she died in the 1940s. Is married to one of the Haymarket Martyrs, um, and and so I'm trying to figure out. Um, so she's she's well known at the time, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. During the time we were looking at it before that, after that, yeah. and it's also known that she's African American. So I'm trying yeah. to figure out: is it because she's a woman, and so when they say that black people can't be can't be Americans, but they really black men? Um, one of the things I haven't gone like too deep into primary sources on her, but. One of the things that I've read is that she didn't, I, she didn't always identify as black, and so part of it may be that people, you know, maybe some folks didn't know it, except that I keep seeing her referred to as black in primary source, and the Goldman calls her black, and she, she clearly is, right? Um, but, you know, so there's no black anarchist except Lucy Parsons, right. who's yes. like married to one of the most famous anarchists that ever lived, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out um, how, how that works. Um, so in the longer version of this paper, I have like a huge note about Lucy Parsons. Um, she's actually one, she's the only non-white woman in my dissertation, right? Um, and you're absolutely right, there's there's a lot of race identification problems with Lucy Parsons. Um, one of the reasons why she didn't make it into this particular section of the paper is we're really kind of talking about something a little bit later. You're right, she rose to fame. And of course, I'll back up and say, a lot of people think she kind of like rode her husband's like wave. Uh, and he eventually, he's a Haymarket murder. He gets, um, you know, hanged. Uh, the anarchists refer to them as the murders, judicial murder, all of this kind of stuff. Um, Haymarket was a great propaganda tool, and she, she used it, right? She, um, after his death, actually before his, his death, like one of the reasons she became so well known was because she peddled the power she meant she was one of the founding members of the IWW. She spoke at their founding convention. Going back to the question of her race, so I I have if you've read her uh, biography by Carolyn Ashbaugh, um, it's problematic. And there's actually a call in wider anarchist studies circles, and a lot of people say, oh, there's such a thing as anarchist studies. There is. It's kind of been growing over the past ten years. Um, there's really been a call to very much question that biography. Um, so, and I have done some of the primary source work. Um, there's this question of, is she black? Is she what she says, which is indigenous, Spanish, um, uh, not black, right? And like she said, you know, no, I'm not. I'm not black, I'm indigenous, Spanish, or whatever. Um, but yet, we have people like Emma Goldman say, well, she's black, right? Um, I'm not sure that we can rely on any of the accounts. Um, the biggest uh, she was born in Waco, Texas. If she was black, she was probably born into slavery. The primary source material um, suggests that she was married and or living with a black man before she met Parsons, who was white. Um, and uh, kind of, they go to Chicago, right? So here's this woman of color with this white man. Um, when a newspaper reporter interviews Albert Parsons when he's in jail during the but basically a year that he was in jail after the Haymarket affair before he was hanged. Um, he, of course, she doesn't tell the reporter. He speaks for her and says, well, she's not black. She's Spanish, indigenous, Mexican, right? And um, uh, another, uh, what we now consider a white ethnicity. Um, so, so he's telling the reporter she's not black, right? Which, you know, is an effective, uh, rhetorical tool. If he knows he's going to die and she's going to be left on her own, they have two children, two young children. Um, you don't want to be a, a single black anarchist mother in Chicago in the 1880s. Uh, you know, uh, it's a lot better to be a different kind of person of color. Um, so there's no definitive proof either way. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't want to put her in here because there's just so much of that story to explain that. But you're absolutely right, she's the one, right? She's the one woman um, who who is out there as uh, a woman, broadly a person of color, um, in the 18, uh, in the 1880s and the 1870s. Um, 
which leads me to believe there's more, right? Um, but we can't find them yet. We're going to get more. Um, did that yeah. answer your question? It's a very complicated um, history and a lot of a lot of material. I think 
actually. So, um, so we know that you know whenever you know when you're around a bunch of historians and someone says, "Here's something that isn't really that well known to you," I turn to the room and say, "I know all about that. It's in my book." Right? But, um, when you you know part of the point you were making is that Oscar Charleston is is kind of been forgotten. And I don't know if this is this gets into like sort of different communities, collective memories, right? But um, you know, I was I was raised by a grandfather who you know grew up in Memphis when Charleston was playing. Um, he was a baseball fan. Um, and knew all of his friends who are on the same generation. Um, and then when I was in junior high school, I started reading into baseball history. I don't ever remember a time when I didn't know who Oscar Charles was. And I know that in terms of like how the Negro leagues are remembered today, you know, everyone remembers Satchel Page, Josh Gibson. You know, they remember the ones who went into the big leagues, so Jack Robinson, Satchel Page. You know, in terms of people who never got to the big leagues, that's basically Josh Gibson, too, like the like we can only remember two names at once from too far ago. So it's uh, your wife's roofing cob with the black that you know, those two. And so he doesn't really make it into that list, but um, I guess, you know, and I'm not from Indianapolis or anything like that, but it's, you know, oh, Oscar Johnson, you know, he's just, he, he's not like a Chris Paul or somebody like that where it's like, we met again. I mean, he's, he's definitely the top 10 of like, he, this is, just hearing stories from my grandpa, like this guy was great, you know. But obviously they're different. Yeah. But what's interesting to me is that I knew who Oscar Robertson was growing right. up in Indiana. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I knew, uh, um, and uh, the Raymond Joswell, the director of the Negro League Museum in Kansas City, told me he once asked Barry Bonds about an Oscar Carlson, had no idea who he was. Mm-hmm. So, and, and he said he wouldn't believe how many uh, big black uh, ball players don't know anything mm-hmm. about this team and these guys. So, um, I accept your, that's great, you know, mm-hmm. and that obviously must be true. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that uh, there is a cultural memory of the trust of the communities um, uh, and how we want to affect African American communities. But it's just interesting to me though, it's not a widespread kind of thing, no. given how popular and famous and respected he was at the time. So, but that's I think it's didn't Charlie Pride play in Memphis when he won the players? Yeah. 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 That was a very late Oscar's career at your grandpa. Yeah that, and that was um, that was even after I think the big start recently. Yeah, but he played in that like 47. Yeah, so that period 47. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We probably have enough time for one more question. Well, I'd like to thank you for coming. I'd like to thank the panel.